you please open up to 1 Timothy, please, the sixth chapter? 1 Timothy 6. I'm going to be preaching fast. Everybody there? First Timothy 6. I'm going to start in verse uh, 10. Um, actually, I'm going to start in verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish, harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Boy, that's true. Those who desire to be rich. It's not all it's cranked up to be. Verse number 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through which many sorrow, through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were also called and confess the, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is blessed and only potentate the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen and can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give and willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for uh, for the time uh, to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. I want to share with you a little bit uh, uh, concerning this passage. This passage is very, very important to... Um, um, to the church. And Paul is writing this to Timothy. Now we know about Timothy a little bit. If you ever came to a Bible study uh, concerning uh, the, uh, the book of Acts and, and the formation of the early church, we know that Timothy was born in uh, Lystra, that his grandmother was Lois, his mother was Eunice, and that during Paul's first missionary journey, Timothy probably was acquainted with Paul because Lois and Eunice were both. They were both devout Christians and they raised, they raised Timothy, uh, with the belief in Almighty God and that Jesus was the Messiah. It is during Paul's second missionary journey that Paul and Timothy form a bond that is closer than ever. Uh, Timothy's father was Greek and so there was a, a schism within the family and um, uh, and was considered really um, uh, not part of the chosen people at all. His mother, of course, was a Jew, but she married a Greek, and that caused her a lot of problems. So in the absence of a real true father in the faith, Paul becomes Timothy's father in the faith. Timothy becomes Paul's son in the faith. And so the first and second Timothy are very intimate letters that Paul writes to Timothy as a father would would write to his son. It's very personal. It gives insight into what all that God uh, is calling Timothy to be. He's a young man when he goes with Paul on that second missionary journey. And in the church of Ephesus, the Lord uses him greatly. And so that's, that's Timothy's, I think I got most of it. Um, uh, Paul leaves Timothy in Ephesus and goes on with the rest of his journey, but they needed him in Ephesus and Timothy become, Timothy becomes the overseer, the pastor, uh, in Ephesus. That passage also talks about very similar stuff that we deal with all the time. First, you know, he says at the beginning of the pa- at the beginning of the passage, "Hey, listen, 
People who are just out for money, it's the root of much evil. And he says, listen, confront them. Let them see that with it becomes great responsibility that to give and to, and to open up. Now, the money, uh, the love of money is the root of much evil. And sometimes, you know, you kind of get addicted to things, you know. You know, if you're addicted to pizza, you put on the pounds. But if you're addicted to making money, you hurt a lot of people. And so Paul is saying that to Timothy, trying to encourage him to see what's important in this life. As a young man, whoa, you know, money. In in today's world, you know, uh, many times in churches, a pastor, uh, 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 he gets a few big spenders in his church, you know, or her church. And it's like, oh, Mr. Jones, oh, you're so kind to us. And never takes the next step to really pastor that person. He just loves the money coming in. And we may say, no, 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 but the reality is that we're all subject to that. And as that's why I don't know what anybody gives. Aren't you glad? Because I, you know, I have other people take care of the money. And that's how it was since the day I walked in. Because everybody's the same. And I, as a pastor, I have to be free to speak to everybody the same way. Isn't that correct? Whether you have a lot of money or little money, I need to share the gospel with you and encourage you to grow in the things of God. And that's exactly what Timothy needed to know and learn. And Paul knew that. And he and he gave him these five commands uh, in this passage. I just want to go over them with you. He says, um, in verse 11, he says, But you, O man, but you, Timothy, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. The first thing he says to Timothy in regard to the rich or in regard to anyone is to flee these things and pursue righteousness. I want to tell you that in this church, we have got to get a handle on fleeing those things that do not produce righteousness. Just because something is lawful doesn't mean that it's expedient for us. There are things every single day that we run into that we shouldn't be involved in. But we find ourselves, and I actually had somebody say to me, it was a couple, well, a while ago, years ago, somebody came up to me uh, and said uh, that they went to see this movie. Have you seen this movie? And it was R-rated. And I said, no, I didn't see it. It's R-rated. They said, well, I'm over 18. I said, oh, Okay. <laughs> They couldn't go to jail to see this movie, but was it the right thing for them to do? Now, I'm not, I'm not passing judgment. I've seen R-rated movies that have to do with violence or stuff like that. I try to stay away from the sexual stuff, but, um, I mean, I've seen it. But the fact of the matter, if that was your, if that's your heart, well, I'm over 18, I can see it. No, that's not, you don't get a pass like that. We have to pursue righteousness. And I'm not getting legalistic here. I'm just saying the righteousness of Christ needs to be our buoy in the, in the water. That, that when we have a choice, we choose to be righteous. We choose to be just. We continue to stand for the things of Christ. He says this, flee those other things. Turn away. Sometimes we think it's not cool if we flee. Are you kidding? My mother used to say to me, because, you know, I was hanging around with a rough crowd, and she would say to me, Vicki, tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who, I, who you are. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. That has nothing to do with me. Until the night the police came to the door. All of a sudden, it, it, it kind of clicked, you know? Tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. What Paul is trying to say to Timothy in this, don't be, even be around that. Protect your heart. Young people, protect your heart. You know, it's so hard. You've got three boys, Karen, you know, to teach them to protect their... Peyton is at that age. Hey, Jing, protect your heart. Don't watch things on television or go into the internet to to see things. And it doesn't have to even be so graphic. I'm saying things that don't please the Lord, things that are unrighteous. Flee those things. Don't be a part of it. 
Don't be a part of the bullying at school or at work or whatever. Be part of what's righteous and good and holy. So the first thing I want to say, this church and the members of this church, we've got to remember to flee those things that are going to bring us down. Because let me tell you something. You hang around with folks that are on their way down. You're a born-again Christian. And after a while, I'm telling you, the voice of the Holy Spirit gets mighty dull. You continue to hang around. You continue to push the envelope. You continue to see those things and listen to those things. I'm telling you, the voice of the Holy Spirit will dull your sense of what's right and not right. Does that sound too religious to you? I'm just giving you experience in my own life. That we have to have some things are just not good for us spiritually surround us. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul says very clearly, so he says, flee those things, but pursue, go after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. And wouldn't you like to have somebody like that in your life? Somebody who is pursuing what's right, a higher calling, an honorable calling, that when they speak, they want to do what's right, not what's, not what's popular or what sounds good. They want to do what's right. I want to be around people that are doing godliness, that they are, they are reflecting the love of God, that through their faith, their love, their patience, and their gentleness, they continue to do what's right and godly. Not only do I want to be around all of you that are doing all of that, I want to do that. I want my life to count for something. I want people, when they think of me, to say, she loved the Lord. Or, you know, you could just see God when she walks in. That's what I want. So so if I have a a habit, uh, you know, uh, I serve with five guys on the council on our side all of them all of them are how can I put this um, earthy in their speech can I say that and so they might say something and then they right away they'll go oh sorry Vicky sorry Vicky sorry Vicky and so sometimes in the in the span of about five or ten minutes all I hear is sorry Vicky sorry Vicky. stop swearing that's all you got to do but I have to tell you, I have to be very careful. I don't come across big and judgmental about them. But for myself, I have to be very, very careful to be not to assume that kind of, well, it's only words. They're not words. They're words that go against the godliness of Almighty God. And I don't want them coming out of my mouth. Does that sound too legalistic for you? I want my mouth to reflect God's glory. I, and you know, not, I, I, I gotta tell you, sometimes, uh, it doesn't only come out of my mouth, but it's in my heart, and then I gotta repent anyway. But the fact of the matter is, my goal is to be righteous. My goal is to, to reflect God's, God's presence in my life. I put my glasses down. Here they are. Oh my goodness. <laughs> All right. So, so I wanted to share that with you, uh, because he says that, uh, pursue righteousness. And then he says this in verse 12. He says, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. There's two things there. He says, fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. Well, what the heck does that mean? Fight the good fight. I want to. I want you to know it's a fight that you, is going to take everything you got, but there's a way to win. Fight the good fight. It it doesn't mean. It means that you can become more disciplined in your faith, so that you fight. You walk in the fight. You walk in the battle. Now, I want to say to you a couple of things about fighting this good fight that we talk about. In the middle of the battle, when you're getting beat up by Satan, ever, anybody ever been there? Where you feel like the, somebody's ripped the rug out from under you, and you feel that, that they're com- it's coming at you from home, from work, from friends, from church. All of this stuff is piling up on you, and you start to have health issues, and this, and this, and this, and you can't catch your breath. In the middle of that, I want to tell you that you can still be victorious. 
But God has prepared us for the fight if we allow him to prepare us for the good fight. Sometimes we might get blindsided if we're not prepared. And I want to tell you, we need to be prepared for the good fight. How do we prepare for the good fight? You know, in, in the area of boxing and, and what have you, all of that stuff, even if, even when you use, you know, you go to uh, the original language, fighting the good fight in Greek, when you go to it, it's really talking more like pursue this, continue to, like, it's almost like a race kind of thing, like a foot race, you know. But before you get in that race, you have to prepare or you're going to hurt a whole lot more than somebody who's prepared and ready for battle. Now, we know in, in Ephesians, let's just go there, okay? I wasn't going to, but let's go to Ephesians 6. We, we've all been there. We know this one. Ephesians 6 says this. Verse 11, 611, you know this. Put on the whole armor of God. I'm going to start in 10. Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You see, God's plan is that we can stand, that we're not going to get beat up or walk around with a big black eye and, you know, bloody nose and, you know, a big thing on our ear because we got whacked on the side of the head. God's plan is that we would be ready for battle. That we can stand and in the middle of standing on the, on the rock who is Christ, we will have victory in that battle. But what happens is we let ourselves get lazy and not ready for battle. So, we don't read our scriptures. Come on. I'm not even going to ask. I'm just going to assume. That there, that we all, and I'm included, that we all could spend more time reading scriptures. How can we fulfill what the call of Christ is in our life? How will we know the, the, the signs of battle coming? How will we know anything if we don't know what the book says? How can we be ready? We can't. So boom, something happens and we, and we fall on our backside because we're, we're taken off guard. We should never be taken off guard. We walk in the battle. God is preparing us for this walk. And so we, where do we get in our, in our, our bulletin this morning? It says, my New Year's resolution, study the Bible and do what it says. That's my New Year's resolution. Very simple. And I want to challenge us in this church. You know, I got to tell you, you, if you weren't here at a quarter of when we had our prayer time, uh, there was really something that happened. I felt the conviction of God and began to weep because I felt, Lord, I have failed in so many areas. Lord, I, 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 I want to do better. Help me do better. And, you know, I want to say to you, it, we have the time to prepare. God is preparing us for whatever the battle is. Read the Bible. Listen, I don't care. You know, people fall out. I'm King James only. I'm living word. I can't understand. So on this, I don't care what version you use except the New World version. Throw that out. That's a piece of junk. I don't care what version you use, but get into the Word of God, a bona fide translated Word of God. And I would suggest, if you've been a Christian for more than 20 minutes, not to use the living translation, but to get into a translation that's, that is um, a literal translation of the Scriptures or um, uh, 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 a bona fide translation of the Scriptures. NIV, Revised Standard. New American, uh, New American Standard. Um, New King James is good. Read King James. I don't care if you read King James. If you don't know what Thou says, is then, then get somebody, get some, get a different translation. But get into the Word. Make a, you know why all of, you know, Weight Watch is on television all, you know, for December and Jan, early January and I mean, you know why? Cause everybody wants to lose weight. My New Year's resolution is to, to lose some weight. Well, I gotta tell you, the reason why they advertise in December and not in March is because by March, everybody's forgotten their New Year's resolution, resolution and they're eating pizza and wings down at IHOP. I want this to be a marathon for us. 
just in your heart, dedicate an hour every once in a while, a few times a week. If you can do it every day, amen. It should be every day. But I'm making that promise that I am going to give an hour to God just in reading. I'm in scripture all the time. You know why? Because I gotta preach. I gotta preach three times a week. Major sermons. And so I'm in the word all the time, but I'm always thinking about, Lord, what do you want me to say? How do you want this to, s- sermon to run? Do you know when I go to Italy, you know, the, one of the biggest blessings I have is I can read the scriptures. Not for any reason other than the love of the Bible. And I, you know, I'm convicted in this myself. I need time just to read the scriptures for the sake of the scriptures. And so do you. We need to be prepared. The second thing is just what what Paul was telling Timothy, walk in righteousness so we can see the signs of when the devil's setting us up because he does. Every once in a while, don't you just feel like you walked into something? Man, I walked into that. I wasn't even thinking. I walked right into that. Because as we walk in righteousness, we become attuned and discern what is not righteousness. We become wise when people come us with hidden agendas. And pretty soon we're able to walk and we know where the... The the potholes are. So walk in righteousness. The next thing I want to say to you is prayer. Now, I believe everybody in this place prays. I do believe that. Probably first thing in the morning, thank you God for getting me up. Help me do what's right today. I love you. Amen. And off we go to work or to school. You know, maybe we stop at lunch and say, thank you, Lord, bless this food. And maybe at supper, thank you, Father, for this meal. And before we go to bed, thank you, Lord, for this day. That's not prayer. Oh, my goodness. That fulfills our obligation, doesn't it? But what about prayer where we commune with God? That we take the time. And maybe your schedule is so busy, maybe you go, well, pastor, you want me to do an hour of Bible reading? You want me to do an hour of prayer? Well, I don't have that time, and I get that. But whatever you choose to do, be a person of your word that you'll do it. If you can give yourself 10 or 15 minutes just to be in communion with God for, for prayer, get, get that time together. Because it's not just you talking to God, but you're also listening from God, and you're getting the battle plan for that day. If you can't spend a a whole hour in the Bible, uh, maybe you can do 15 minutes. But when you sit down, be prepared to do that. Give yourself 15 or 20 minutes when you sit down to get into the Word. And you can use the Sunday sermon as your, as your, your, your catalyst. You can go this week and say, you know what, I'm just going to focus on 1 Timothy 6 uh, verses uh, 9 through the end of the chapter. And use that and meditate on that. Read that and, 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 and get a handle on it. Those are things that prepare us for battle. And I want to tell you something. This church has prayer on Thursday nights. And sometimes I understand. I live 45 minutes away. And it's hard for me to get here. And so I end up not coming on Thursday nights. But that doesn't mean that if you're in the vicinity that you can't come. Please come out on Thursday nights. If you are, I mean, there's a million excuses why we don't come, right? I mean, that's really my excuse. I, I, I'm really feeling more and more convicted about it. But if we can come together and pray, I'm thinking about putting additional prayer time. You know, on Sunday morning, sometimes at 9.30 we have prayer. And that's really nice. But I'm thinking of another prayer time for the for the uh, 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 in January. So we're going to pray about that. But we've got to come together because our call is not just for ourselves, but it's for the church. And corporate prayer is prayer is exactly that. I want to go back a little bit, and I'm sorry I'm going on, but I have to finish. Is that all right with everybody? Let me finish. Let me finish. So we are called to flee. We're called to pursue righteousness. And then it says we have to fight the good fight. That's the third one. Listen, we don't give up. 
We keep going. We don't look away from the fight. We look at the fight. We recognize the fight. We call it a fight. And we're prepared to enter into the fight. And so now, uh, uh, what it says in in, uh, in Ephesians 6, and it says this, uh, putting on the whole armor of God, and uh, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The battle is the Lord's. We are fighting against spiritual demons and and the hosts of hell that want to derail us. The Lord is our shepherd and Satan knows that he cannot have our heart, cannot have our spirit because we belong to the Lord. But man, if he can make us ineffective, that's a victory. So we get complacent, we get tired, we stop fighting the fight, we let it go on and we just, you know, you just go, we just go along with the flow. And yet we're in the battle for our lives and those people around us and we're lulled into complacency by Satan. And I want to tell you something, it's the truth. Understand your enemy. Understand who's trying to derail you, to make you ineffective, that you would, that you would follow, uh, things that are not of godliness. Things that have nothing to do with Christ. It says this. I take on the whole armor of God that you be able to withstand uh, in the evil day and having done all, stand. Just stand for righteousness and godliness and love and compassion. Stand. And it goes on to talk about the shield of faith and having your feet shod with the gospel. Take the helmet of salvation, always praying. Um, and being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. This battle that we're in is the long haul. And we can have victory in it. Because victory belongs to the Lord. But if God is not in this battle, there is no victory. And let me tell you something. This church is in a battle. I, I, you know, we've got family here, so I can just speak. This church is in a battle right now for existence. I'm not sure where God is going to lead us, but I'm sure of one thing. If we are not obedient, we will not see the glory of God in this church. I am telling you the truth when I say this to you, that that the enemy has set his sights on this church because we preach the truth, we stand together, we love one another, and I want to tell you he's going to do everything he can to tear us down. And I'm not being crazy. I, I, I don't preach like this. All of you know, most of you know, that I, well, sometimes I preach crazy, that's true. But But what I'm saying is true, and you know that. And if the devil would thwart you, if the, th- if the devil would come and undermine you, are you kidding? Of course the devil is coming after Christ Community Church. A place where people are loved and cherished and what have you. And the devil has posted enemies all around this church so that we will not fulfill the call of Christ in this church. But I want to tell the devil and tell everybody here that the devil is a liar from hell and that we will fulfill the call of Christ because there are people sitting in this church right now that have committed themselves to the law of God that have committed an obedience to put laying their life on the altar of Christ and that they will follow the calling of Christ and this church will continue take that Satan I want you to know that from the bottom of my heart that we're not giving up this fight but I got to tell you we need to be warriors and standing for the righteous things of Christ this church should be standing for righteousness in the community when East Haddam thinks about where is a church standing for righteousness Christ community church should be standing up now that means that we're going to be changing some things in the coming year we've got to We have got to bring this church outside. We have got to let people know that we believe in God, who he is, and the promises for their lives. It is not going to be easy, but I want you to understand that if God has called us to it, he's equipping us now, before 2020, that we are ready for the battle that we're going to fight this battle and stir up the gift of God that's inside of us because God's got things for us to do. 
So we keep fighting. We don't look away. And we understand that the things that we're doing right now build up discipline in our heart. We're not, we're not babies anymore. We don't need the, the milk of the gospel. We need the meat of the gospel. We've been following Christ for a long time and we just keep wanting to just, no. We've got to have the meat of the gospel. Because let me tell you something. Because what's come against us individually and us as a church needs the meat of the gospel to withstand it. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. We're fighting for our families. We're fighting for our loved ones. We're fighting for us to make it through the day. We're fighting for the church to be established. This is a miracle that we stand even as we do now. Because of your graciousness and your uh, generosity and your love for the church. I'm telling you, it's a miracle happening right here. But we cannot back aside. We cannot uh, uh, say, well, I, I tie. That should be enough, right? No, it's not enough. It requires the heart that goes after the lost. It requires the heart that sees the the one that left the 99 and say, I'm going to go after that one. It requires us to get out of what we're used to doing into a whole new mindset. And i got to tell you, 2020 is going to be it. I'm telling you, we're going to have opportunities. I pray that you, I mean, I hope I'm not scaring you. Am I scaring anybody? I'm scaring me. Um, Because I really want to see us change. I want us to get out and get and 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 hear from the Lord that there would be an excitement in our hearts anymore. And listen, I can't do it for you. I I I can't do it. I can do it for me. I got excited during worship today. I was uh, jumping all around, and all of a sudden, I said, "You look like a jerk, Vicky. Calm down." You know. But that is something within your heart that has to be stirred by Almighty God. Get ready for battle. We're going in. You know, I feel like, who was it, MacArthur? Okay, boys, we're going in. Some of you may not make it, but we're going in. i got to tell you, we're all going to make it. Hang on. Trust God. We've got battle to do. The joy of it all is that while we're getting stronger, while we're eating the meat of the gospel, while we're, t- while we're taking down strongholds, while we're doing all that, guess what? The enemy's getting weaker. And the enemy's starting to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. But that's exactly what we're going to do. In the next few weeks, I want to talk more about taking down strongholds, about what do we do when we see something in our own lives? What do we do when we see something in the life of the church? You know, I've had to really uh, come face to face with, uh, am, am I really listening for the voice of God within this church? Have we turned the deaf ear? Are we just plodding along? We're not plodding anymore. I feel like we've been plodding for a while. But I, we're not plodding anymore. We're moving on in victory with Jesus. And I, I, I'm telling you, I am excited about it. I'm a little scared about it. But I know we can do it. Only because I'm old. You know what <laughs> I'm so old. God doesn't care. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's the sad thing about it. God doesn't care, you know. Um, I just want to. I just want to. There's just two other places, because uh, in in this First Timothy, fight the good fight. I just. He says, take hold. Take hold of what I'm telling you. Where is it? Verse 12, thank you. Fight the good fight. Lay hold of the eternal life, which you were also called and have confessed the good confession. Take hold of it. When you go back to the original Greek on that, it's not like, like just take my hand, yeah, okay. No, that's not it. It's this. Take hold of it like it's yours. That's what it means in the scriptures. Take hold of it. It's yours. Eternal life is ours. Take hold of that. Let that be uh, uh, in your heart always. You have eternal life. It has been promised. It's there for you. Now walk like you have eternal life. It's like the same thing, you know, when you when you're some around somebody who's like so rich. You ever been around somebody so rich? And I've been around a couple of people that are so rich, and they just take hold of things like it's their right because they're rich. We have eternal life. Take hold of that. Eternal life. 
is ours. And then Paul goes on to tell him, commands him to, to, to do all of that. And then it says, um, keep this command. Live a life worthy of the calling. Keep this command. Just don't be a January Christian. Keep this. Lay hold of it. Grab it. Keep it. It's yours. And keep it. Don't give it away for anybody. Not for your friends. Not for your neighbors. Not for the folks you work with. Not for uh, the world. Don't give it away for anything. It's yours. God has brought you to this. He's given this to you. He's established. He's even established you in this kingdom. Oh my Lord Jesus. Help us Lord to realize what you're doing Lord. He has established us in this kingdom. He's given us the solid rock. And he's placed our feet on that rock for all of eternity in heaven. I'm telling you we serve a mighty God that would grab us from wherever we were and some of you were pretty far down I want to tell you something. I was too I know. He grabbed us and brought us up out of that and cleaned us up and put his robe on us and he placed us on the rock which was Jesus. 